in an era when faith and power were intertwined, a humble monk challenged the spiritual empire of the Pope. He questioned the authority of the Roman Catholic Church to act as intermediary between the faithful and God. Martin Luther boldly nailed his objections on the gates of a prominent church in Germany. The echoes of his defiant hammer could be heard over a very large distance. What followed was an era of chaos and civil wars. But ultimately, this led to the foundation of a new Europe. Christianity was altered forever. And several new ideas, such as secularism, nationalism, individual rights and freedoms, were cemented because of this age, which we call as Reformation. Welcome fellow time travelers to this episode of World History Concepts. If you are new over here, then in this series, I, Jawad Kazi, take up certain key concepts, seminal concepts from world history, and we discuss it together to understand their full import. In this video, we are going to discuss the idea of reformation. Let us now dive deeper inside the idea of reformation and understand this concept thoroughly. Before we get into the concept, guys, we need to know an important development in Europe in 1054 AD. 1054 AD saw the great schism or east-west schism in Christianity. Schism means a divide, guys, basically. In 1054, the Christian world got divided into the Western Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church being based in Constantinople or modern-day Istanbul. Because of irreconcilable theological as well as political differences, the two churches went their separate way. The Roman Church excommunicated the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the same was reciprocated back in kind. And since then, these two churches have been the fundamental divide in the Christian world to this date. Yes, later many denominations were born, but a schism like this did not ever happen again. Now, in today's discussion, when we talk about Reformation, our focus is going to be on the Western Roman Catholic Church. Let us now try to understand, guys, what was the role of Roman Catholic Church in Europe before the age of Reformation. In a previous lecture on Renaissance, I have dealt with in detail the role of Roman Catholic Church. In case you haven't watched the earlier videos, click on the description box link for the playlist and you can watch all of them so that you understand these concepts in an organic sequence. The Western Roman Catholic Church played a very crucial role in socio-politico-economic life of West Europe. It was in cahoots with those in power. It was a symbiotic relationship between the two. Those in power got legitimacy from the church and the church received benefits from the state. And this kind of a relationship was a happy one for both the parties. But in the process, the church became extremely strong and over the years also it became corrupt. The priests who were supposed to be guides for spiritual and moral life of the people they went on to become more pleasure seeking. And slowly, steadily, the moral authority of the church started to decline. Many practices seeped in, which were not exactly in coherence with the central idea of Christianity as taught by Jesus Christ. A very notable one amongst them was the letter of indulgences. What were these letter of indulgences? And how did they lead to reformation? is the discussion that now we advance to. But not before meeting the hero of this story, Martin Luther. Martin Luther, dear students, was a student from Germany. His father wanted to make him a lawyer. But Martin Luther was always spiritually inclined. And so he dropped out from law education and instead became a monk. The Roman Catholic Church 
had the practice of celibacy amongst its monks. So Martin Luther left his life of a householder and he becomes a monk. And he starts to also teach theology in different institutions. Serving as both a professor and priest, he was then given an opportunity to visit Rome for overseeing the Augustinian monasteries in Rome, German Augustinian monasteries. When Martin Luther was traveling to Rome, he was expecting to see a elevated status of spirituality in the holy city. He had hoped that he would be able to enhance his understanding about the religion. But when he reached there, he found things quite to the contrary. He found the place to be lacking in spirituality. The authorities of the church were anything but spiritual. Their life was centered around pleasure and extracting the maximum possible benefits from the lay followers. All of this led to development of revulsion in the minds of Martin Luther towards the institution of church. He became pessimistic about their attitudes, about their role in the society. And particularly appalling to him was this same practice of letter of indulgence. Now, what is meant by letter of indulgence? According to the understanding of Christianity of Roman Catholic Church at that point, a soul after death in this life could go to either of three stations, heaven, hell or a purgatory in between. Now, heaven and hell are easy to understand. Purgatory was a place where good souls who still had some elements of sin were sent. These good souls had to spend some time over there which could, which could range for, from a few years to several hundred or thousand years. And then after becoming purified, it could enter into heaven. This was so because some traces of sin were still lacking. And to overcome this or to, you know, bypass this time spent in purgatory, people on earth could buy, purchase these letters of indulgences. These letters of indul indulgences were like a promise that the soul will not have to spend the concerned period in purgatory and it can go to heaven directly. Or if the amount paid is lesser, then the time duration in purgatory could be substantially reduced and then the soul would ultimately go to heaven. Now, this idea was clearly not a spiritual one, not something that was coherent with the key ideas of Christianity. And therefore, Martin Luther found this to be a very abhorrent kind of a practice. His anger reached its peak when, to build St. Peter's Basilica, Pope asked the church officials to sell the letter of indulgences to common people. Martin Luther by that time had returned and he objected to this idea of common people, poor people being sold these letters of indulgences. Now, the lay followers did not understand the nitty-gritties of religion. Bible was in Latin, which they could not relate to or understand. And the priests were taking an advantage of this. Martin Luther could just not stand this. And therefore, he said that something needs to be done about it. So, what does Martin Luther do? Martin Luther theorized his argument into what is called as the 95 Theses. These 95 theses were basically his core arguments against the idea or practice of letter of indulgences in particular and many other issues of corruption with the church in general. He went to the local church in Wittenberg and nailed those ideas over there. It was a routine practice back then to nail certain write-ups or ideas on which you wanted to have some debate. Martin Luther did the same so that there could be a debate on whether these ideas of letter of indulgences and several other practices are actually Christian-like or no. He expected that through these debates, he will be able to convince others that these things need to be given up. But far from it. Instead of changing themselves, the officials started to put pressure on local rulers 
to have Martin Luther be punished or at least make him recant from his views. But Martin Luther stood firm. He had the support of local people. He also had the soft corner of many ruling elites of that area. And he also demonstrated that moral courage to stand by his convictions and did not recant from his beliefs. When he saw that the church was not changing and instead it was pressurizing him to give up on his ideas, he started to feel more and more distant from the institution of church. Totally steadily, he started to organize his ideas and from those thoughts developed a movement within Christianity which is called as Protestantism and the overall age is called as Reformation. His ideas spread like a wildfire. Back in those days, Gutenberg's printing press had revolutionized producing of books. Using the printing press, he published Bible in local language, that is German, not in Latin, and ensured that these copies could be spread over the Germanic states, thus enabling anybody who could read and write to first-hand understand the word of God as Christian saw it. And then it was hoped that they could compare and see what the church was doing and what actually the word of God said. While this was being done by Martin Luther, there were many others also who were of the same thought. People like Zwingli in Switzerland, William Farrell, John Calvin in France, all of these people also shared the same ideas. Some of them were also themselves inspired by the thought of Martin Luther. In their respective territories, areas, regions, they popularized the same ideas and from this the spread of Protestantism or Protestant Reformation takes place in Europe. Many countries like Switzerland, Scotland, Transylvania, this is in Central Europe, all of these areas became more amenable to Protestant form of Christianity rather than the Roman Catholic form. Slowly, the popularity of Roman Catholic Church was shrinking and that of Protestants was increasing. This was the first severe challenge post the schism that the Roman Catholic Church was facing. To add to its woes, King Henry VIII of England, he established a separate church for his country called as the Anglican Church. So he cut off ties from the Roman Catholic Church and instead established a separate church for his country. This was not for spiritual reasons, he has his own political motives for that. But nevertheless, around this same time, when the Roman Catholic Church is being challenged on continental Europe, even England is not behind, even England cuts off its ties with the Roman Catholic Church and starts its own Anglican Church. Sweden and then later Netherlands also started to follow Protestant form of Christianity. Thus, in a relatively short span of time, the ideas that were generated from the thought of Martin Luther and others like him became immensely popular in Europe. This, after several decades, made the Roman Catholic Church understand its flaws or its mistakes. So, the Roman Catholic Church also tried to come to terms with the change situation and reform itself. This process is called as the counter reformation. So, Protestant reformation is the first phase. As a response to that, after a few decades comes the effort of Roman Catholic Church to change itself. And that is called as counter reformation. What takes place in this counter reformation? The Pope tried to reform some of the more glaring abuses of power in the church. They tried to bring more moral codes for the priests so that the people would not feel repulsion towards the kind of activities that were going on at that time. Jesuit priests were sent across different distant colonies to actually arrest the spread of Protestantism. They were already spreading it in, they were already doing it in the European continent, but they were also further sent to distant areas that were occupied in the Americas or the New World as well as to Asia so that 
the spread of Protestantism could be arrested. Slowly, steadily, the Roman Catholic Church was able to win back some of its earlier followership. But by the time they actually started to take some steps, already Protestantism had become very popular. The case was already made by it against the Roman Catholic Church. And therefore, these efforts could not stop the spread of Protestantism. They could only control it to some extent. And that schism or divide that developed in Christianity between Roman Catholic Church and different forms of Protestantism that continued over the centuries and does so even today. Now, what were the outcomes of these developments, these schisms or these conflicts within Christianity? Let us see a few of them. This led to several wars of religion. Already Europe was always a tinderbox. There were a lot of political axes to be grinded. And religious differences provided another important fissure on which countries could, nations could fight against one another. So we see within France, there was war between Protestants and Catholics in which the Catholics side won. The Scottish uprising was again based on religious wars. Dutch rebellion also in many ways was because of religious differences. And in this manner, the several wars that were being fought in Europe were in one way or the other being contributed by these religious differences. The famous 30 years war, which ends in 1648, the famous 30 years war was also basically fought because of this difference between Catholics and Protestants. Catholics and Protestants fought for 30 years, killing millions of people, okay, not just combatants, but also non-combatants, just because of sectarian differences. At the end of this war, with the Treaty of Westphalia, finally this age of reformation comes to an end and Europe starts a new era, a new phase. So these were the wars that were fought, guys, because of the differences of Catholics and Protestants. Now, lastly, we shall see the important consequences of this difference of sex. First consequence, fragmentation of Christianity. The Christian world had already been split into the Eastern Orthodoxy and the Western Roman Catholic Church. Within the Western Roman Catholic Church, now further, there were many other fragments that emerged. There were Calvinists, there were Huguenots, there were Presbyterians, there were Protestants. All of these different sects basically emerged after this challenge of Martin Luther and his Reformation. Many new sects came about over smaller doctrinal differences. So, Christian world kept on getting more and more fragmented. That is consequence number one. Consequence number two, new ideas of nationalism and nation state were born after Westphalia. Westphalian state as we call it in political science was born with the Treaty of Westphalia 1648. Earlier, we used to have empires that included very disparate kind of regions. The idea of a modern nation and nation state owe their origin to Treaty of Westphalia. And this Treaty of Westphalia came about because of the 30 years war and 30 years war was fought because of sectarian differences. So indirectly we can say the reformation gave us the modern nation state concept also. Third, the idea of state and religion must be separate. The fusing of these two creates a lot of chaos and therefore state and religion must be separate. Religion must be a private affair. This is the idea of western secularism. This western secularism was also an outcome of the conflicts that emerged because of these differences. So in that sense, this modern idea has also come out of it. Fourthly, individual freedoms, the rights and freedoms of individual to choose whom they want to worship and how they want to worship. This should be a domain of every individual's decision making. The state should not in any way enforce upon others regarding this. 
So this idea of individual rights also owes its origin to these conflicts. Fifth, migration to new colonies. With emergence of several new sects, there were conflicts within European countries. And many of these new sects wanted to have freedom of worship. They wanted to have a place where they could believe in their God the way they wanted to and worship him the way they felt was appropriate. And hence many of these people migrated to the new world. Several American colonies were actually inhabited by people who did not find freedom of religion in Europe and therefore they migrated to this new world. So it provided the human resource for the new world. Then the concept or idea of Protestant work ethic. Protestant work ethic is about, you know, being thrifty, hardworking, believing in the help of God and constantly striving to do your best in this world. Roman Catholic Church's idea was more oriented towards the afterlife, whereas the Protestants were equally concerned about doing well in this life. And to do well in this life, you have to be hardworking, you have to educate yourself, you have to take efforts, you have to save money. These kind of concepts came together to form a culture which is called as Protestant work ethic. This Protestant work ethic was responsible for success of USA in its initial decades or initial years. So this was again an outcome of this conflict also. Then lastly, decline in influence of Pope and Church. The institution that had played such a significant role for several centuries in Europe, after this point will start to wane in influence. So much so that in 1870, finally, when Italy is united, at that point, even the small papal state will be wiped out. And the whole of Italy will be in, uh, united from north to south and the Pope will be left only with his limited presence in the Vatican. Yes, later on Vatican City was given some recognition as a sovereign small entity but then it was, it is nowhere in comparison to the kind of role that this institution once had played. On that note guys, I am concluding this discussion on the concept of reformation. I will urge you all to do leave some comment in the chat box below, in the comment box below and also like this video. If you are finding these useful then share it with your friends and also let me know if you would like to watch some more videos on different concepts. Whatever concepts you want, my, want me to make videos on, do comment them in the comment box below. I will surely make videos on them too. Thank you very much. I will see you in my next episode. Good day.